the ark. I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about the ark other than to say, this is everything you can imagine in a boot camp. Typical one to two years of startup development are crammed into 14 weeks. And those of you that are ARC participants are just really getting to the point of appreciating that. But that's an amazing thing. That's another super efficient way of taking mentorship and business leaders and focus and compressing time. Because the scarcest resource you have, either as an existing CEO or as a new CEO, is time. And anything you can do to compress time and achieve more is a good thing. And that's really what the ARC is intended to do. And the goal is obviously to try to make you all a little bit better at telling the story in a short amount of time. We've had great mentors from across the region, across the state, across the nation, and internationally that have made this thing possible. Here's a recap. First time through, we had 15 companies. Seven of them were from outside of the state. Pretty remarkable, either international or outside of the state. We had 86 applicants from 14 countries. It ran from August to November, and the good news is that six of those 15 companies, and this is a pretty high percentage, actually received follow-on finance and are moving forward. And the others have either, if they haven't been successful, have glommed on to some of the existing teams. It's a pretty high hit rate. ARC2, thanks largely to Jeanette's tireless leadership, and I said something about her last year, which I'll reiterate. For her, sleep is optional, but excellence is not. I don't know how she gets it done, but I get emails from her all times of day or night, so thank you for your efforts, Jeanette. We've got 93 applicants from 15 countries. We picked the top 10. This whole thing will, accumulate on, uh, will culminate on September 5th. I'm really optimistic about the quality of the teams this year. We've got three, that have come, three of the teams that have come from out of the country, and the other seven that from in-state are from all over the state, not just here. And again, we've raised private investment to support this again, thanks largely to the commitment from a whole lot of different people. Okay, so building the funding continuum. How do you keep this thing going? Getting into Harvard is actually easier than raising venture capital. And yes, we've had three instances in the last two months where we've had out-of-state venture capital. So that shows it is possible. Acumen is a perfect example of how that can be done. And this is evidence of it. If you wanted to emulate or pattern match or look at a comparable, uh, the way that you would want to do these sorts of things, it's prototypical. And a lot of it did start with that original conversation that John and I had, but I can't take any credit for what went on after that. That was John and Terry and David Echevoyan and Greg Prem and Chuck Browning. John hired the very best people he could find that complemented his skills. And they were tireless and tenacious and were unrelenting that entire time. That's why they were successful. It was tough, believe me. It all looks like a storybook now to go from zero, basically, to a $100 million revenue company in less than three years. I can tell you there were tough times for that team. There were tough times from that team when their outside venture capital initially was questioning if they were really as crazy as they seemed and if they could pull this off, and they did. They did. They set themselves up for serendipity by having a fantastic team aligned. And this, if you want to study, do the case study now. Learn as much as you can about what they did and how they did it and emulate it because it was meaningful. What comes next? We've got a bunch of the pieces in place. We really got to get this larger venture fund put together over the course of the next two years. We want to have 25 to $50 million venture fund that's nested locally, that's sector focused, that can be used to advance these things when they get to the point that they need it. We cannot continue to rely on out-of-state venture capital to propel us to the next level. We've got to be able to lead deals and syndicate with those good relationships that we've built out-of-state. Okay, so this is the recap on this first part, and then we get the part that I really came to talk about, and thank you for putting up with that. When you put somebody that's an adjunct faculty member, God knows how long they'll talk, and this wasn't quite as bad as a PhD dissertation, but I realized I violated the 10-20-30 rule in all sorts of ways, so anyway, this is from wilderness to a beginning. You guys, we're at the beginning of the beginning. It's not time really to sit back and, and slap ourselves on the back. We've got so much more to do. The road ahead, we're going to get this Venture Center thing done, and we will get a larger local VC fund established. So moving to a few thoughts for CEOs, and these are kind of aimed at the folks that haven't been swimming in this bathwater already. My challenge to all of you is drive continuous reinvention. Your successes in the past cannot be looked at as any guarantee 
of future reward or competitiveness. Question everything you do. Really look to drive the continuous reinvention. Because for those of you that are running successful businesses, there's 10 other people right behind you that are looking at your market, that are learning about your customers, that are going to introduce something that competes with what you're already doing. So question what you're doing and look to continuously reinvent. Use this Lean Canvas tool. I introduced this tool now as a project management tool to all kinds of organizations. This is a methodology. It's a problem-solving methodology that allows you to identify the problems, to quantify the problems, to understand what your customer or your stakeholder wants, and then to progressively drive risk out of the equation. If you think about this from a project management standpoint, this is a tool that can tell you what projects you ought to implement. It's an effective way of doing governance. What meets the criteria? Is that problem worth solving? Will someone pay for it? What's the cost structure? What will the returns be? It's a common sense methodology where strategy meets agility, in my opinion. So enable this idea of cross-functional creative collisions. And here you see four startup founders, one from the software side, one from the co-creation side. You've got somebody that's leading the maker movement, somebody from digital design. Enable those creative collisions. The coffee shops around here are as good an enable as anything else. I get more meetings done in Orsegas on Dixon than anywhere else around here because I normally see 10 people that I know. These people wonder, does that guy have a real job? Why is he always in Orsegas? It's mostly because I run into people that I need to talk to while I'm there. As a business owner, figure out how to set up the structure of your office and your organization and your events around this idea that these creative collisions are going to be useful. Google has inter internalized this. They've been very intentional about how they've done it. Cross-functional discussions. That water cooler talk, coffee pot talk, that's not a waste of time. That's where business gets done. A lot of these places and these opportunities within organizations are the equivalent of playing around a golf to get the deal signed, right? It's just we need to do it more intentionally all the time. Creative collisions, it's important, across functions. Embrace this idea of open innovation. So you might say, well, what's open innovation? You know, there's another buzzword, and I am kind of a buzzword generator guy. I think you could probably run a Dilbertian buzzword, and I'd probably said most of them one time or another. But the idea of open innovation is this. Is as your business grows, as you get larger, you're not going to think of all the great ideas. You're not going to have a cost structure to think of all the great ideas. You're not going to have all the talent. So you've got to figure out a way to take advantage in a mutually beneficial way of the innovative developments that other small companies are coming up with. There's all kinds of ways to do that, and we'll talk about it. You can in-license what they're doing. You can joint venture with them. You can partner, teaming agreements, the whole variety of things. And as you think about it, some of those initial steps you take of partnering with small companies to solve the big problems that you don't have the cost structure or the agility to solve, that's teeing up potential acquisitions for you in the future. You can get involved with them early on on some kind of contractual basis, and it's teeing up potential acquisitions in the future. So it's a way to grow. I say here something that could be a little controversial for those of us who have been used to law and order and different things. I say empower and reward the disruptors. The crazy people in your organizations that are always thinking of something new, like Drew Dobson, he's crazier than most, <laughs> are the ones you want to embrace. You're not going to keep them forever. Because they're just that crazy that they're going to get to a point where they're going to outgrow the organization. That's a reality, and that's my next slide. But figure out a way to embrace and reward the disruptors. The people are constantly asking why. The people are coming up with a new idea. You don't want to stifle the creativity out just for the sake of law and order within the organization. Figure out how to embrace it. It's important. The best organizations of any size have learned how to manage this creative process. And it can be really frustrating. Really frustrating. Try to be a project manager when you have a bunch of creative people and get something done against a time schedule or a budget. It's, it can be daunting, but it's possible, and so you need to figure out how to embrace and reward the people that are disruptive within the organization. Okay, so this is this idea of churn. I can remember during the last boom, the tech boom in the 90s around the, the Washington, D.C. corridor, they said that the typical technology person was changing jobs every 18 months. That's tough to manage, but that's a reality. Those of you that are millennials, a little younger, may change jobs 14 times. You've really internalized the idea that you're an artisan or, or a craftsperson and that you're going to take your skills wherever the interesting projects are. 
So as business owners, you've got to realize that mindset is out there. People are not necessarily signing up with you for the long haul. Figure out how to manage that churn. Now, I'd say that this goldfish here is probably jumping the wrong direction from my point of view. You know, we want to see it going the other way a lot of times. But it can go both ways. So we have to be ready for that churn. You have to be ready to manage that. And you can't act as though if you're an existing business owner that somebody's been exiled or excommunicated. They don't need to be shunned. You don't turn your back on them. You've got to embrace that natural churn. When they leave, they're going to leave on good terms and you understand why they've left and you maintain good relationships with them because they may come back to you at some point. They may create a venture that you want to acquire or partner with. You've got to embrace that. It's not as if they've defected from behind the Iron Curtain. Although, I guess that there's one guy that's sitting in the Moscow airport right now who's probably thinking a lot about that. So here's a, here's a few strategies for, for placing bets. And I know this is, this is one where you're kind of wondering, what's the, what's the context of this? I would, I would challenge all of those of you who are more established in the business community to step one is get involved. Get involved. That doesn't mean you have to write checks or be an investor. But it means come out to events like this. Go to Gone in 60 Seconds. Go to the Natural State Angel Association. Nobody's going to ask you for anything other than eat a nice meal and hear about some great businesses. Go to Creatives United. Go to Tech Drinks. Go to Geek Weekly. Get out and get engaged. If you're an existing veteran business leader or CEO, the best thing you can do initially is share that wealth of experience and knowledge you have with that next generation coming up. And it doesn't cost much other than some of your time. That's the first bet that you want to place. That's where this community vitality that we're talking about will grow. The second thing is, seriously look at placing some bets from a financial standpoint on some of these companies that are in spaces related to what you're doing. Very effective strategy. Companies like SAIC, Amgen, Deutsche Telekom, any number of big companies will place small bets, minority bets, in small companies that are related to the space they're in. Why? Well, they might get a return on it, they might not, but it's giving them visibility into what's coming next. Why did Dillard's put nearly $5 million into Acumen Brands? Because they really want to know how the hell they implement that robotic warehouse system that Acumen implemented in three months and it had taken them two years and they hadn't gotten it done. I mean, that was one of them. They also, I think, wanted to Grab the tiger by the tail to understand what was coming next. What could they do to revitalize Dillards.com? So think about placing bets in that regard. So it's engagement. It's maybe placing minority bets. It's maybe thinking about you know, acquisition strategy in the future. Those are the kinds of things you can do. That was long-winded, and I apologize for that, but I'm ready for any questions at this point. Thank you, Jeff. You bet. And if you're not, not totally exhausted, fire away. Yes, sir. I've got a question. So as I've come into the startup scene, lean methodology is all I've heard about. How long has it been a respected um, path to take to use the lean method? Great question. Lean has been around in a manufacturing context for 30 years. It's just being reapplied to business model development. The thing about it is it's hard to argue with the logic, right? So let's look at it from, from its original roots. Back in the days of COBOL and when Boeing was deploying nuclear missiles and Trident submarines and all that kind of stuff, we talk about development mo methodologies, either waterfall, which is where you plan everything out and you write your specs, you do a little bit of coding and you do a little bit of testing and you finally deploy and you, and you get done with the end of that two year to three year process and you find, find out well we developed something that doesn't meet the requirements right and so spiral what we originally called agile came about the reason why I draw that analogy is that's that was a 30 year old discussion right all they've done with lean is apply that to business model business model okay and if you look at it even a little more fundamentally all it really is is sound use of scientific method. What's the hypothesis or the assumption? How are we going to test that that hypothesis is meaningful and do that repeatedly? So from that standpoint, it's got a basis that goes back hundreds of years. We're just now getting smart about the way we're applying it to developing a good business model, in my opinion. There was a software company started in the early 2000s. Spent $10 million of capital, never made a sale. Would you like to have that capital? Iterate me some uh, yeah. 
Lane Campus. Well, and I'll give you I'll give you just I'll give you just one more example. If you look at Carnegie Mellon, again, this is software specific, but it, it really is it's kind of a case in point. Based on historical statistics, only four percent of all application and software development finish on time, within budget, while meeting performance requirements. And that's largely for all kinds of reasons. Mostly, maybe they didn't even look to see if they were solving a business problem that anyone cared about, right? It's technology running a thousand miles an hour into the marketplace was something that hadn't been validated, as an example. Other questions? Um, I really enjoyed the Venn diagrams. <laughs> um, in what in what method, like, so the, the bubbles aren't equal now. Yeah. Uh, but I would, I'd, I'd also I'd say that, that maybe they don't have that much overlap. How are, so. How'd I, I do that? Yeah. How, I, how I, I did that. It was, it was totally a uh, uh, wild ass guess, Drew, to tell you the truth. Well, right? How are you going to make the bubbles bigger? How are you going to make them bigger? More? Well, you make them bigger by doing all the stuff that we've been doing. So. The university's kind of here, and it's a top 100 research institution, so you kind of got that, right? We've got the flagship industries are here, and we can take pride in the legacy that we have on entrepreneurship. So what you do is you work the programs, the placemaking, the events, the networking, the talent development, and the capital to drive the ship forward. That's all you do. And over time, it's not like a boulder rolling down a hill, like I said, that's going to bowl everybody other, over where it's my way or the highway. It's the snowball will continue to pick up speed and momentum. Success begets success. So as we see more exits, as we see more investment, as we see more great concepts come to life, it continues the momentum. I also think just in this region, everybody's been collaborating over the years. Right. We started with a bunch of hills and nothing else. You know, there just wasn't anything to do around here for a lot of years until Ken, Ken Seville could tell you, until some truckers and, and Sam got going and they moved some chickens around. <laughs> yeah, I, t I tell you what, they are, are adversity and necessity drive a lot of the best things that we've got to look at well, today. We're a lot more collaborative and a lot more willing to, to help each other. The That's right. Mike Malone's organization is representative of that. Yes, That's sir. right. So how big is the snowball right now? Uh, it's beyond nanoscale. Too bad <laughs> AJ's not here. It's beyond nanoscale. You can see it. And it's funny. It's funny that you mention that because... One of the things that we've kind of ruefully looked at over the years is this map that shows where the venture deals and the new business starts are happening. And you see this gigantic, enormous size of Saturn bubble over Silicon Valley, and you see something pretty good size over Austin, something over Boston. And I mean, it would truly have been nanoscale over South Central and particularly Arkansas. Recently, it's visible, right? It's visible, it's, it's starting to happen. So that's why I say it's the beginning of the beginning but now's the time where we've got to put a little bit more structure, a little bit more of a team in place so that we can really drive a train through it. We want to capitalize on the momentum. It's as healthy a snowball it is. size as you might find, I would think. And, you, it's, you. and it is being held out on kind of a as, as a, as a model, believe it or not, in a lot of these emerging market areas. I've had the opportunity to travel to uh, St. John's, Newfoundland, where they're world class in ocean engineering, in Halifax, where they do some pretty interesting things in digital design. The example that we have here and the things that, that this group has done it, are being heralded as kind of the right way to do it when you're not a place where there's already a lot of momentum. So, sir. You mentioned a small team of five folks that want to start this year. What, what, what's, what are the first few things that you want to tackle with that group? It, it's going to be improving communication, coordination, collaboration. It's, it's going to be just the structure to where there can be some repeatability and consistency of what we do. So right now, how do we decide where the Gone in 60 Seconds events are going to be? Well, that's pretty ad hoc and chaotic. You know, there's two or three of us who get around and say, hey, what are we going to do about that? Do we have a website, for example, for Natural State Angel Association? No. I mean, that's been totally a bootstrap. All these things have been bootstrapped with not a lot of money. And so now we're trying to figure out if we were to do this right, and add some more structure and something that's going to be lasting, how are we going to add repeatability and continuity to the process? You've got to set it up to where if some of the, the, the people that have been principally involved disappear for whatever reason, that it's going to continue. And right now, there's, there's a few key people around the region where if Jeanette decided you know, she was going to move to South Africa tomorrow, I don't know what we'd do, quite honestly. So we've got to build an organization that's going to have a lasting effect without it being tied to any specific individual. Give her a great big range. Right. <laughs> right. She's not going anywhere. We're going to make sure of it. We've got a GPS tracker on her. Yeah. <laughs>
Sir. Jeff, you talked a little bit about um, raising capital just inside of Arkansas instead of just pulling it all out from the outside. Mm -hmm. What do you see as far as um, creating organizations? I mean, I know that you're part of a couple of them, but what's the what's what's next for that in that space? Well, there's more there's more to be done in the angel space, and I'll give you a, a for exa for example. Again, we've got a good start in the early stage, the seed investing, the 25k to 250k type of investments with natural state, with gravity, with Fund for Arkansas Future, and with and with others. But there's 10,000 households in Washington and Benton County alone that meet the criteria, the Securities Exchange Commission, for accredited investors. And I could tell you that the number of active angel investors in those two counties could easily fit into this room, and probably just in the first two rows. So there's more room for that. Question? When you guys start raising the 25 million, what's going to be the minimum investment? The minimum investment? Yeah. 24,500,000. No. No, are you talking? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Have you got your checkbook? <laughs> it's a good question. And so the traditional way of doing that is you've got general partners. And they, their task is to go out and raise the money. The question is, would it be 100000 or 500000 It might be in that kind of a ballpark. Because if it's too many small chunks, it will take too long to get done. It's to 300 probably. Yeah, that's right. Um, so if, uh, if a young entrepreneur, like let's say, if Lucas Dean uh, has a, an idea or a solution that he wants to bring to a company, that he sees an opportunity that maybe they're not seeing, um, how, how does an entrepreneur approach a company with, with a, maybe a single solution for a single problem? And do they wrap a startup around that and, and go to them as a startup? Or how, how do you approach that? Yeah, it's a good question. It's a good question. So on the one hand, ideas are cheap, right? And, and a lot of times, ideas are, are not all that, always all that original. So you're in a better position if you can build a little bit around it. Right. So if you, if you have the idea and you can develop something and you can validate it a little bit, it's a whole lot better than just walk in and say, hey, we've analyzed your business and these are some opportunities. And you know what? They, they may or may not have seen that, but that doesn't give you really any kind of leverage to be a good partner in the discussion. You have to build something that you can show them. And the one thing I'll say is when you're trying to establish your own brand, being able to shoot from someone else's shoulder, a big brand that sees you as being that agile little guy that can solve problems that they're not structured, that's a good strategy. That's what Ryan Frazier has done with TAG, with TAG, with DataRank. He can do things in social insights. It wouldn't make sense for them if they look at their non-recurring engineering costs to try to build what he has. But you don't really want to have that conversation until you've got something built. Otherwise, you've just given them an idea. And, it, and two, if you go running in there and say, well, I've got this great idea and sign a non-disclosure, they're going to say, see ya. They're not going to waste their time. So you've got to have something built. What it amounts to. So build something and then go. That's right. That's right. And I want to get back to I want to get back to Max's question. So even if we do this nested local venture fund, we're not saying we're not going to allow outside capital in. We want to be a better syndicate partner for those guys. So that the next time Noral Mosley Partners or Five Elms or General Atlantic or name another one, Trailblazer Capital, they Fulcrum Equity Partners, they want to come here. You can partner on a deal. We'd like, to, we'd like to be more than in the round off of some of these deals, right? You know, tag along, we'd like to actually help lead. And the, the strategy with that is, what do we really know around here? We, we know a lot about retail, CPG, and related technologies. We know a lot about e-commerce and customer insights. We know a lot about transportation and logistics. Let's lever that. This fund is not going to be focused on everything in the universe that we do. It's going to be focused on the, the area where we have strength university research-based projects as well, but it's going to be very focused. We're not going to claim to know everything about the broad spectrum of life science or tech. We're going to try to focus this next big fund on the stuff we know best. Does that make sense? Sir? Sorry, I No, no, that's good. So that fund, that would be another C fund, but then what's the, is that, what's the next stage after this? That one's going to really be focused on Series A. Series. So that one's going to be focused on 500-ish K to a few million investment. We've got the, the end below that pretty well figured out. So it's the gap between the two to 10 million and the true seed where we have the biggest problem. That's where the temptation will be for some of these young companies to say, we can't get that next round here, so we've got to go elsewhere. We don't want that to happen because if they have to spend six months raising a Series A or a setup for a Series A, they may just leave the area to go find the money. We don't want that to happen. So are they going to go, like after that, what's the next stage? Do they go public or they sell out? Or how, 
yeah, you know, public markets, yeah, I hate it when we talk about IPOs mostly because it's fictional pursuit yeah. post-2001. Whenever I see that in a student presentation, I was just like, take that out. That's an ejection seat slide. Uh, uh, you know, the bottom line on that is it's acquisition for the and, most part. And, you're, you're, and you get to a certain stage where you're refinancing all the time. That's right. And you get another larger private equity fund exactly. that marks it to market for the other private equity funds so that the pension funds can know if they made any money over a five-year period. So that's kind of the whole spectrum. You can better off stay private more it, so today. It can happen. It can happen, but it's rare. It, no, no, no. I mean, it's, it's a good question. It's rare. It's unfortunate that it's rare because that's made the venture fund model much more difficult than it was in the 90s. But what you should take away is you're always refinancing, so you've got to serve your shareholders. And one way to do that is you've got to let them market to market and let them go away and bring in some new ones. So you've got to be thinking about what the next, next round of capital likes and where they are and start developing those relationships before you need, need to get them to cash yeah, yeah, out. Does that and, make sense? And I know it is frustrating because particularly for those of you that want to focus on execution and building the business, but 25 to 50 percent of your time as a startup founder or CEO is going to be spent on fundraising if you're intending to scale. Now, if you're really good, you can maybe scale it by bootstrapping. The best money ever is customer money, but if you want to scale quickly, that's an allocation of time, which is really annoying, but pretty essential to have to get through. If you do it smart, you, you'll learn a lot from the people who fund you. That's right. Have we worn you out? More questions? Let me mention one more thing about Jeff. So you see Jeff execute. Uh, uh, know that uh, it took him a lot of years and a lot of adversity and a lot of to, to create this steel of a man. And uh, he didn't get there overnight. So uh, embrace your adversity, embrace your challenges, because that's how you eventually get to someone like Jeff. And what is he? He's positive. He, he's, he, he, uh, 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 he likes the others to have success. He's collaborative. He's trustworthy. And those are skills that all all of us need, regardless of what we're doing. Well, that was nice, Sam. Thank you. It's true. Thank you. Very important. Thank you all. We agree. <laughs>